they'll not back the government in, I don't think they will anyway, in crucial matters. Until they get paid off. Mm. Really, we're near. I'm just waiting for some code apparently to get the live stream for a few minutes. So everything's done so that we can possibly do it here because that's what we need first. We need someone to turn up the dive. Don't forget. Live stream. stage I don't believe we're ever going to get anywhere <laughs> and then it just your hands just happens just, yeah your hands can't just take over what do you mean by live streaming it's now on the computer and if you wanted to switch on all you right see it happening in real time all right live and then, then it's recorded and then just put on the website and then you can oh, okay. just click so on it. Can't, there's no deletes. <laughs> yeah. Can't censor. Well, that has stops people, so don't worry about censoring. I doubt anybody will be watching, though. Hopefully, they'll do be watching. Sorry. Don't mind right. you. No. Let me to lift it up. Should have brought a hair clip. Yeah. I'll put hair over it in the end, but you just need to yeah. know what hair is going over. Yeah. Some of these things, you should start with the skull. Oh my word, what's that? Quick, guys. Yeah. This is a parallel people are. Oh, they're good. Looks like come to catch moths. Yeah. Yeah. Peter, that's not on the film. <laughs> Brilliant. Love that. That's something like Monty Python. You're on your eyes now. You're okay. Thanks, guys. Thank you. You can smoke now. Yeah, you can. <laughs> we have to turn it off because this stuff sets off the smoke. Oh, yeah. Oh, is that what they were doing to yeah, it? Oh. Stop the Special dispensation. Dying to know about you, but I can't ask you any questions. <laughs> oh, there we go. <laughs> yeah. 
Because they're generally very interesting, these conversations. Are they? Good, I hope I can make mine interesting. Huh? We're live, okay. So, right. <coughs> Hello, my name's Lawrence, and what's your name? My name's Jean Crane. Jean Crane. Yeah. And you come from? Askin. Askin. And that's how far out of well, Doncaster? That's about seven miles, seven miles out, out of Doncaster. And there's a pit there? There was a pit there, there's yeah, not a no, pit no, there no. anymore, and that closed in. 1989, I, th right. I think. Okay. And so you're fa you've always come from Askin, your family yeah, from Askin? Yeah. You really? I was born in Askin. My dad was a miner. My husband, he was a miner, but he always worked on, on the surface. Okay. And what does that mean? Um, on the surface. Well, he worked with the coal after the, after it was okay. mined. You know, he worked on the washers and. Um, the wagons and that kind of thing. Yeah. And uh, when you say you've always come, you were born in Askin, does that mean your generation is going back? Um, well, no, my mum and dad were both um, from Durham. Oh, right. So yeah. you're part of kind of the so Durham we, diaspora. Yeah, yeah, where they came to Askin for work. Right. So, um, so yeah, I, I was like first generation asking person, mm. yeah. Uh, my husband worked at the pit in the 74 strike, was it 74? 74, okay. Yeah. And that was that the first strike that, I mean, in your... It's the first one I can remember, yeah. yeah. The dad like worked to rules and... Um, and what was that yeah. one about? Uh, well, that was about wages. Right. I mean, the actual, the 84, 85 strike was the first strike that wasn't about wages, mm. it was about keeping jobs. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, all the strikes before were about conditions or wages yeah. or, but this really was the first stand about actually saving jobs. Yeah. So, and you, you're, you didn't, you obviously didn't work in the mines. No, no. Did you I did, work? I did work. Um, where was I working when the strike started? I worked at a news agency in Doncaster Town Centre. Oh, really? Yeah. I was, um, I was the shop manager. And um, Phil wasn't a union, he was a member of the union, he wasn't a union member, but um, he was very much involved in the strike. And when, when we first started trying to raise funds for the striking miners, we actually did it on behalf of the union. Right. We um, we went out, probably about half a dozen of us went out with our collecting tins around Pontefract and Doncaster, came back, counted up what we'd collected and we, we would give it to the union because they were paying picketing miners a pound a day for picketing because obviously none of them had any money coming in. Mm. And this went on for a few weeks and then Pat Hewitt, who was... Um, I think he was the union, Askin Union president, said, rather than collect for the union, why don't you set up a, a support group? Lots of different pits are doing it. And, you know, they're setting up these soup kitchens and um, raising funds and using them that way, food parcels. So we thought about it because none of us had ever been involved in, in anything like this before, any fundraising. So we thought about it and we, put a few posters out and spoke to a few people that we knew and we held a meeting and there were probably about 20, 25 women turned up right. um, and so we set up the Ask a Women's Support Group. Um, I was the secretary um, and one of the first things that we did, somebody lent us um, a book and it had it was just full of union names and addresses. Mm. Some of the most obscure union names, candle makers, and really? yeah, dyers, all sorts. And about six of us sat in my, around my kitchen table. We writing pad, pens and writing pads and this book. And we wrote to practically every union in that book. Really? <laughs> yeah. 
all by hand. Yeah. And we, ha we actually got loads and loads of donations yeah. from unions that, you know, that we'd never, ever heard of. Um, <laughs> and then at our Ask of Miners Welfare, we actually, we had a kitchen. Mm. So that became our soup kitchen. Um, <clears throat> And so this is the club, this is the club that's in the village town. Yeah, the Ascombe Miners Welfare. Um, over the years, it had been used as a business. So you went out on a Saturday night, you know, you had a few, you had a few drinks, and then you went into the, um, the cafe and had pie and peas or mm. chips, pie and peas before you went home. But by this time, it wasn't being used. So we utilised it as our Was it not being used because of the strike? No, it was not being used. It was not being used because nobody wanted to use it as a business anymore. Oh, okay. So it was never actually run by the club. It was run as a business. Private, a private business. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so the soup kitchen was set up. So all the facilities were there. All you had to do was get yes, kids. that's right. Um, so the soup kitchen was set up, um, and then. Because of the letters that we sent out, we were adopted. Our, our support group was adopted by quite a few organisations. Um, Southwark Council. Southwark? Southwark Council, really? yeah. In London? Yeah. Merton in London. Really? Yeah. So what do you mean adopted? They just sort of... They took, a, took, our, they took our women's support group on as their project. As oh, they, yeah. We were the support group that they were going to raise funds for. Good Lord. Um, there was a union called, I can't remember what it stands for, but it was called ACTS, A-C-T-S-S. -S. They were another one that really? um, raised funds for us, yeah. Um, the NUJ, they were very um, active in raising funds for us. So we had lots of um, gatherings in Ask a Miners Welfare where these people would come down with the donations and... Uh, to be honest, we had some really, really good times. I was very lucky during the strike because I was working full time. You were still working? Yeah, I was working. Um, uh, so we travelled. We still went out collecting locally, mm. but um, we travelled to London quite often and we spoke at um, union offices or uh, at council offices. Um, we once did a, a spoke to a full council. I can't I can't actually remember which council that was. I can just remember this massive room, a bit like Parliament actually, massive. Like obviously it was a town hall. Um, so a council's allowed to kind of elect um, causes. Like well, I, 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 I'm, it probably wasn't the council itself. Mm. It was the council workers. You know the council, the, yeah, the, yeah. the members of the union. Um, but we did, we did address one of the councils in, in London, like say at this big town hall, I just can't remember yeah. which council it was. Um, so yeah, we, we became really quite a wealthy um, <laughs> support group. Yeah, we did hundreds and hundreds of uh, food parcels every week. Really? Every week. How many miners were you trying to help? Um, to be honest, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know how many miners there were at working at Askin at that time. Um, I'm sure you could find out. Yeah. Diane might know, actually, when you interview Diane. Uh, <coughs> so we did the food parcels, we did the soup kitchen, and the soup kitchen was so, so um, successful that people started to complain when they came for the meals that peas and carrots again. <laughs> um, so you're basically but, running yeah, a restaurant. Yeah, honestly, the, the women that worked in that soup kitchen, I didn't because I was no working job. full time. But on my days off, I, I would probably go down. I was very lucky <coughs> because I had a really, really good boss. Oh, and nice. if there was a delegation going off somewhere to London, he used to say to me, get your shift covered, Jean, and go and it just allowed me whenever there was anything needed doing it always just said just get somebody in to replace yourself for the day 
two days and do it. We. Um, how long did this go on for? I mean, how long was this? The strike? Yeah. Well, it was just a year, wasn't it? Mm. It was just a year. So how long did it take you to galvanise all that? Within months, within probably a couple of months. It was, it was great. We had this great big, massive um, concert room at the welfare and all these boxes of everything for the food parcels and people walking around and, you know, and then somebody else putting them all in carrier bags, <coughs> taking them out. We had Chris... Did you deliver them or did people come to the... Um, it, well, people could come, but there were some, there were like, there were some people that lived at Upton, um, and there were some people that lived at Hickleton. So then the union, we'd, um, the men on the union would take them out. You know, they'd actually yeah, deliver them. them. Yeah. Okay. It was... Um, and was it mainly food you dealt with? It yeah. Wasn't, you didn't have any other role, as it were, or quite uh, other... No, we... Um, it was mainly... The, it was a soup kitchen. It was a, well, it was a raising of the funds, the soup kitchen. Yeah. Um, and the food parcels. We, we, we went picketing. Right. Diane, who you're going to meet this afternoon, actually got arrested and was really? held overnight. Yeah, really? that was at Calverton. She'll tell you about that herself. Um, so, yeah, I can remember the first time we ever, ever went picketing and we made a banner. And um, we still actually got that. Really? Yeah. And it said, it was red with, we put yellow bias binding on it to make this shield. And I can remember it said, um, what did it say? It said, our, our choice, uh, what, oh God, what did it say? I know part of it said our duty to serve anyway. And we had it on two sticks. And we went, first time any women went picketing from Askin, I think it was to Annesley. And I can remember getting out of the minivan and furling this flag that we'd made. And there were all these men picketing. We had to cross a field. And I can remember walking over towards this huge picket line of men and them seeing these women walking over this field and they were cheering. Really? Oh, yeah. It was... Really? The hair stand up on your, really? on your arms and the back of your neck. Yeah. Blimey. Yeah. That was the first time that anybody from... any women from Askin went picketing. But there must have been about 25, maybe 30 real women that just did everything they could for the whole time that the strike was on. You know, they dedicated all the spare time to making sure that those meals were served, that those food parcels went out. It was, it was absolutely amazing. You know, women, that none of us had ever done anything like it before. Um, it was just, told, we'd, we had a Christmas party. In fact, we had two Christmas parties, but the one during the strike, and we bought a present for every child, and we had Sheila, um, one of the ladies that was in the uh, support group. She was Father Christmas, and very few kids recognised her. Funnily enough, some people said, "I know who you are." She had a very distinctive voice, Sheila, and I can remember, you know, the odd one would say, "You're not Father Christmas. You're Sheila, or you're Mrs. Gibbon." But um, and we had. F ladies in fancy dress, dressed as clowns, and it was an absolutely wonderful day, honestly. It was it were brilliant. Um, the following, that was the Christmas, in the, in the um, summer, funnily enough, after the strike, um, we took, uh, we, we had money left over, and we still, we still even had money coming in, and um, we took a, a trip to the seaside and we gave every child five pound spending money and there were so many buses that the last bus hadn't left the car park at the welfare when the first bus was about three quarters of a mile down the road really yeah yeah we had so many 
Um, so the whole of Askin was on the move? Oh yeah, yeah. It was... Um, so arriving must have been a blooming nightmare. Yeah, but it was, it was a really, really wonderful day. We, everybody had a really good time. But that was, that was after the end of the strike. Yeah. Because like I say, we still had, people were still donating. People were still um, sending parcels. We, you know, a van had turned up with, I don't know, a load of cooking oil or some of the tins, we got tin, tin, whole, tin whole chickens and, God. yeah. And so, the, and so the following Christmas, which was again the Christmas after the strike, we actually used the last of our money to put on another Christmas party. Yeah. Yeah, we once had a, I can remember once somebody came into the soup kitchen and said to some of the, um, the fellas there, I've got some chickens. If you want to come down, um, pick them up, you can. So off they went, I can't remember where, I, it was a farm somewhere, and they came back with these chickens that needed plucking and cleaning. And one of them said, he was all right telling us he had some chickens for us. He said, he didn't tell us we had to, we actually had to catch them and kill them. Oh, no. Yeah, so they, that, were, that was a bit off-putting. <laughs> and I can remember one time we'd been sent some um, big cartons of um, yellow liquid yeah. uh, from, I don't know if it, I, I can't remember where from, it was from Russia or Bulgaria or somewhere, along with lots of other stuff. But um, I can remember that the ladies in the soup kitchen thought it was cooking oil and only realised at the last minute that it was actually washing up liquid. <laughs> so that was, that was a tragedy averted. <laughs> so are you telling me someone from, Vol someone from Bulgaria? Someone came from, someone sent stuff from Bulgaria? Sent stuff, yeah. So it wasn't just an English, is it a British thing? It, it came, we had money came from everywhere. Oh, yeah. yeah. After the strike, some of the ladies um, actually went to Russia. Really? They were invited over there, yeah. The only one that I can remember um, going was a lady called Barbara Green. And funnily enough, I was, the other week, I went to, um, down to the welfare to watch a play called The Last Scene. Yes, that, I heard about that. The, the casting, Doncaster, yeah, yeah. put on. Um, and Barbara's son was there. Um, Barbara's passed away now. <coughs> but he actually had in his pocket the badges, the union badges that his mum had brought back from Russia. Wow. And he'd got them out on the table showing them to us. Good God. So I'm getting the picture that actually it's a bit like, no, it's a, it's, a, it's a crass comparison, but it's almost like wartime Britain. It's almost like a, com uh, a community came together. It, it did. And, and, and it did. created, it was closer. Yeah. Through this than it was. But only, strangely enough, you know, people still talk about a community spirit. Mm. And during the strike, there really, really was. And it was, it was a wonder to behold, honestly. Really? Everybody spoke to everybody. Um, it was just, everybody was there for everybody else. Um, and did you have much in the way of people that carried on working? I don't want to use the term. But, I mean, people that were... We had one or two. And were they having a hard... Were, were, they, yeah. were they having a... I mean, they were. Tough. They were having a hard time. Um, one in particular was my brother-in-law's nephew. Um, and even now... This is my brother-in-law and sister-in-law live in Australia. Mm. Um, but um, I, I do see them, obviously, quite often. Uh, but even now we don't talk about it because my brother-in-law says he did what was right for his family mm. but he didn't have a family at the time. He had a wife who worked and he had no children mm. and it's something that we've never ever been able to agree on. Reconcile. Mm. Yeah. God. And then, the, funnily enough, he emigrated and bought the plot of land and built a house right next door to my daughter and her husband, who, whose husband was a miner and was on strike. Jesus. So you can imagine. So he walked right out of the frying pan yeah. into it. 
yeah, so that made that a bit awkward. Um, Gosh. But, you know, the spirit, I mean, you work through this and you, you create, I mean, I imagine you create a high, not a hierarchy, but, I mean, you've got people obviously running the soup kitchen and people have to do some orders and stuff yeah. and tell, tell people what's going on and what's coming. Yeah. I mean, you're not really ordering material, are you? Just no, receiving we're just, stuff. Yeah, we're just using... So one day it's a bag of potatoes, the next day it's a bag of peas. Yeah. And it's like yeah. pea soup today, potato <laughs> soup. Yeah. Working out what's going on. Yeah. And then someone has got to sort of put their brain to gear and get all that. And then there's sort of a whole right. structure and a hierarchy must develop. Yeah. Well, Gwen, Gwen Goodwin, um, she worked in our pit canteen. Mm. Um, so she kind of was the organiser of the soup kitchen. She knew, you know, what should be cooked when, what should should do the menus, what, what should we have today, what have we got? Okay, so we'll use this today and we'll have we'll have that on Wednesday and you know, we might have to compromise a bit on Friday because we might have to do more than one dish because we haven't got enough to give everybody the same thing. Um, but like I say, the the women were just down there every day you know I, I could call in on my way to work and the people I, I started work at like um, half past seven and there'd be people already down there getting stuff prepared and when I came home and I'd call in those same people would mm. still be there doing the cleaning and preparing vegetables for tomorrow it was just God. people were just so dedicated and I think, I think that we all just because we'd all been just been mums and housewives, or you know, some of us worked. But I think we felt more of a purpose. Yeah. I think we were felt like it made us feel like we were more. Yeah. Yeah. So, what do you think would have happened if you hadn't formed that? How? What? What would have? Uh, if we hadn't formed if you, hadn't, if you hadn't done what you did, and you're all the blokes and all the miners were out there and you were supporting it, how how would it, how would the course of the strike been changed? Um, I think when I, I think there might have been a few more went back, but I still think that they would have endured the hardship mm. just simply because of the reason that they were on strike. You know, there'd never been a strike before that was not about wages or conditions. This was about saving the jobs, and not just their jobs, jobs for future generations. Yeah. You know, and, and they were passionate about it. And it, it was actually, you know, the way that the men encouraged the women to get involved. You know, these, these were men that were used to coming in from work and the tea being on the table or, mm. you know, the clothes being clean. And they encouraged the wives to get involved, and I think they were well. They were proud of them. Mm. I think they were proud of, of what they'd achieved. And kids, and they were all they were living normal lives. I mean, they were just getting on with their lives, going to school and stuff. Yeah, How was it affecting yeah, them? Yeah, I suppose they were. They were, except um, I can't remember about school meals. Obviously, the kids that had that weren't at school age used to come to the soup kitchen and on a weekend they'd all, you know, the kids, the school kids had come. I can't actually remember if kid, the kids got free dinners or not. Mm. I would imagine not, actually. I would imagine not. Really? Uh, some people were too proud to use the soup kitchen even. Yeah. You know. But is that what it was called? It was called did the soup call kitchen. kitchen. We did. You didn't call it like, give it a nice restaurant. No, there. we didn't. We called, ah. it, we called it the soup kitchen. You didn't try and dress it up? No. I can remember once um, somebody come into us and telling us about a couple that lived um, in the village that had never been to the soup kitchen. And they said that they were really struggling. Would we go down and have a word? So me and Phil went down. Phil was my husband. Um, we went down. Um, and we told them why we were there. We asked them, you know, could we do anything to help? And she actually told us that she was so hungry that she was getting up in the night and eating into what little food they had while he was asleep. Jeez. She was so hungry. Bloody so hell. we went out 
and not from um, not from the uh, strike funds, but Phil and I went out and we bought them bread and butter and milk and and we persuaded her to come and work in our soup kitchen and we persuaded him to, um, he was a foreign chap um, and he, he was probably nearing retirement age um, but we, we persuaded him to um, stand on our picket line at Asken which was very... So they weren't know, involved at all? No. He, he was a minor. And he, wasn't, he wasn't going to work? No, no, he wasn't. He was just no, that, just no. Not, he just opted out. He was just it. too proud to, um, you know, to take advantage of yeah. the stuff that was offered. Charity, was yes, it? yeah. But, um, so he went on the picket line at Asking, got a quid a day. Um, she came to work in the soup kitchen, then he started to come for his meals at the soup kitchen. Um, but then I can remember the first time I saw her after the strike, um, and you know how you, like, you're walking towards somebody that you know and you're kind of getting ready to say, hello, how are you? And it was as if she'd never seen me before in her life. Yeah. It, she just honestly, and I guess it again, it was embarrassment. It was the fact that, because by then, by this time things were pretty much back to normal. But I guess it was embarrassment to thinking about what had happened and how she'd had to accept charity because there was, you know, there was no other way they were going to get through it. But you gave her kind of a dignity to say, come and help. Yeah, than, but, than yeah. But um, like I say, I, you know, I'm walking towards her thinking, oh, there, I can't even remember her name now, but oh, there's so-and-so. And like you get there and you, you kind of... Yeah, I know the oh, feeling yeah. very well. Yeah, <laughs> honestly. That was a lot in my life. I was, it, it made me quite breathless. It really, really, you know, really took me aback. But again, yeah. like I say, it was probably embarrassment. And it's funny how it manifests itself. Yeah. Like that, it? Into it sort is. of quite rudeness, really. Yeah. Yeah. People panicking, I suppose. Socially. So, so when it all finished, when you stopped, I mean, did, I mean, I, don't know, I hate to say it, it sounds really bad, but. Did people kind of miss the... Miss I think the, they did. I think, the, I think it, it was a, an enjoyable time for the people that were involved. It was, a, it, it, it was a time where they felt useful. They felt like, you know, they were doing something for the community rather than just for the family. Um, and yeah, I actually think... I, I, I can't speak for everybody. Um, and like I say, I was lucky I was working. I actually enjoyed it. So, yeah. Well, the good thing about it, it's not, and it sounds really silly to say you're enjoying it. And not silly, mm. but it sounds, you've got a cause and you're really happy to be belonging to some Absolutely. kind of mission. Yeah. And which is above the everyday, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. And there's an urgency to everyday, I imagine, which you never, yeah. we'd never have no. again. No. And you're in a fight. Yeah. We're in a bloody fight. Yeah. And it was, and it, like I say, it wasn't a fight for more money. It wasn't, you weren't looking to line your pockets. No. Although, I've got to say that some people in our village thought that the women's group were lining the pockets. Oh, God, really? You always get well. that. You always get that. Um, I suppose you feel like being a butcher in the war. My yeah. grandfather was a butcher in the war, so he was a reserved occupation. So he had the allocation of the meat. Yeah. And everyone thought that he was. Uh, Oh yeah, everybody thought we were filling our pantries yeah. with food that was I coming bet, in. I bet you were scrupulously yeah. uh, well, putting had, everyone before you. You really had to be, honestly, you had yeah. to be very, Same. very open. I can remember once I was on my way to work and I was on one of the seats, sometimes on a bus you've got two double seats facing yeah. at the front of the bus. So I was sat here, there were two women facing me and they were talking about food parcels. Um, her husband was a deputy, actually, and um, she said, uh, I was listening to the conversation, because like I say, they were facing me, and one of them said to the other, um, yeah, you know, it's, she said, there's, um, there's a garage at Sutton that is absolutely teeming with food. She said, um, I don't know what they're going to do with it, she said, but it's not right. She said, um, they shouldn't be storing food like that. And the conversation went on and on, and in the end, I just leant forward and I touched her on her knee and I said, um, you know this garage that's 
teaming with food at Sutton. She said, yeah. I said, can you tell me where it is? I said, because I'm actually part of that women's group. I said, so if you tell me where it is, you know, we can, we can go up there and do it. Oh, oh, well, well, I'm only telling her what somebody's told me, you know, and yeah. That obviously didn't exist at all. No, no, it didn't exist at all. Because I would have known about it. So. But yeah, you always get people that think you don't do anything unless it's for your own benefit. Yeah. You just. How many were in the women's group? I would say um, probably about 25 or 30. Wow, so it's quite a small, tight knit. Yeah. I mean, I was there a. Did you have loads and loads of people want to be a part of it, but there wasn't enough work? No, we, we would never have turned anybody away. No. We'd never have turned anybody away. But you know, people had people had young kids. They couldn't, you know, they could, they just couldn't give the time up. Um, they were grateful for what you were doing. Um, but no, we would never have turned anybody away. We would always have found something for somebody to do that wanted to give us that time. It was never like a, you know, like a Wasn't closed like a shop. Like a no, no, never, no. And did other all? I mean, were you one of the first? For example, we've got all these. Let's say, let's say, for example, say, say goodbye. We got twelve pit towns. Mm. Did were you the first group to get going amongst those pit towns? No, or was it all happening at the same time. No, uh, there were, some women's groups were, were set up before ours. Because that's, you know, like I said, when we first started, we were collecting and giving it to the union. Right. And it was because the union had heard of other pits that were setting up women's support groups that they said, look, instead of giving this money to us, why don't you set up a, you know, a women's support group? They've done it at other pits and it seems to be working really well. So we actually just followed suit of other pits. We weren't by no means the first... Right pit to set up um, a support group and I'm sure there were some support groups that were a lot more successful than we were mm. you know that had a bigger workforce that um, had more people to cater for because I mean, you could have been dealing with I mean what do you think you don't really know how many min miners are on strike or been affected but you must have known how many were availing in your facility or using your um, I don't actually yeah. no because you know like um, some people might come every day, some people mm. might come twice a week, some people had families, you know, um, wider families that were working that didn't take advantage of it. So, um, I mean, we did, I would say we catered in, in the soup kitchen itself um, for well over 100 every day, mm -hmm. 100 people every day. Um, sometimes they were queuing, you know, sometimes you might have they might just come in in dribs and drabs, but um, it was, there were a lot and a lot of people used that, actually used that soup kitchen. I think one of the things that, you know, you talk about community and how everybody got together. After the strike, um, I don't know if you remember, I can't really remember the reason myself. I think it was, there was a strike by journalists that, um, because, was it because they were moving? Whopping. Yes. Yeah, whopping. The whole trade unions, the print yeah, unions. the print, print unions. Yeah. Um, Murdoch was going for them, wasn't it? That's right. And so, because of all the support we'd had during the strike, um, we decided we'd have a fundraiser and then you ask a miners welfare for them. You know, they'd done it for us. Mm. And so we put all these posters out and um, we arranged this really big night. We invited people down, up, I should say, from mm. London. Um, and we thought, this is going to be good. We're going to raise some funds here for these people that are on strike. And um, we were so excited about it. Mm. And came the night and came the people from London that turned up and were so grateful that we were having this fundraiser for them. And the turnout was absolutely pathetic. I know, what, from the village town? Yeah. 
it was I was it was embarrassing. Oh no. Honestly. Sounds like one of my talks. <laughs> yeah, it was embarrassing. It was you know you had to apologize. Really. Honestly. And these people had really put the and it wasn't that long after the strike. It yeah. wasn't long enough for people to have forgotten or so that sense of community was already evaporating. Yeah. Yeah. It was. It was um God, it's amazing how quick. Yeah. Because I was gonna say, I wonder what it manifests. I mean, did that energy turn into something? But it does sound like it just evaporated. It no. And was that because I mean effectively you won a stay of execution, didn't you, with that strike? Do you think? Because the mine is the mine's closed in eighty nine. So they must have carried on for another four or five years. Yeah, but not all of them. No. Did they? It was Yours just did, Askin did. Yeah, yeah. But um How many closed down in the area? At that, at well, that time? Um I think I'm not sure if Askin was the the last one. I think Brody had already closed mm. before Askin. Um such a long time ago I can't remember. Mm. Oh, thank it's you. Cold water. Thanks. I can't remember in what order they they did actually close. But, but yeah. But I, I just think that that thing with the um, with the journalists, it was just such an opportunity to pe for people to show the gratitude for what yeah. they'd done for us, and the people that turned up were the people that had been heavily involved in the strike. You know, the people that had put the work in. So the, you know, like the union members and the families, but we didn't, we didn't even fill all the tables. Mm. And Ask a Miners Welfare at that time was like on a weekend, especially was a hive of activity. It was always, you know, on a Saturday, for a Friday and Saturday night, it used to be the place to be, but it was like God. dead. It was honestly. What about 20 people turned up? It was probably a few more than that, but just not enough to make a difference to these people that had travelled from London, and it was just awful. Embarrassing. Mm. But that's what people, you know what I mean? when. I suppose when people have been through something like a year-long strike, they just either want to, want to forget it, get back to normal, get back to what they were doing before then. So, some of us had joined um, Askin Labour Party. Well, we joined the Labour Party um, and started to attend council meetings and um, stuff like that after the strike. Um, and then, there was a vacancy on Askin Town Council. And at that time, Askin Town Council would, was run by um, older people, you know, mm. like people that had been on the council for ages. And if there was a vacancy, then you would co-opt somebody on. So we were at a council meeting and um, a vacancy did arise and somebody put forward that, right, we'll co-opt, I can't even, I don't know who it was, but, oh yeah, we do, anyway, we'd, we'll co-opt this person on to our council. Um, and somebody in, that was attending the meeting said, well, I want to nominate somebody to, um, to be the next, you know, to take the place of this councillor that had retired or whatever. Um, so this chap, nominated me to be <laughs> Did on you know the council. It no. Oh God. No I didn't. Um, and somebody else seconded it. Um, and they weren't happy at all. Who what the the council really? weren't happy. Because they'd they'd been so used to um, just like I say, you somebody that they got on with. Yeah. Oh do you want to do you want to come out council, yeah. Oh, I see. So yeah. so anyway, I was nominated and um, they weren't happy. So what happened was the, the chap that they wanted to co-opt on, they persuaded him to put up as a 
independent labour. And then they started to go on about, you know, not, I, don't, I don't think they had a council election for about 15 years. Mm -hmm. um, do you know how much it's going to cost the council if, if we have to go to election and we have to cost us this and it will cost us that? Um, but anyway, we had an election um, and I won. Really? So I was elected to the council, to Askin Town Council. Um, yeah. And so what happened then? Um, I eventually became Mayor of Askin. Really? I did, yes. That no. was in 1992 into 93 when, um, when I became Mayor of Askin. Um, sadly, my husband passed away suddenly mm. in 1993. Um, and at the end of my term, um, I resigned and kind of went back into my little shell, yeah. like you do when you have a bereavement. But in, the, in between that, in between the strike ending and um, me retiring from the council, uh, myself, Diane Hogg, who you'll see this afternoon, my husband, her husband, um, Sheila Gibbon, we started to do um, a prize bingo oh. uh, to raise funds. It, it, it was kind of part of the um, Asken Town Council. We called it ALCO, Asken Labour Charity Organisation. And um, so we had this prize bingo once a week and uh, any, any profit that we made um, we used for good causes in the village. I, can't re I actually couldn't tell you one single charitable thing that we did because I can't remember. Um, but you remember the bingo? Yes, I remember <laughs> the bingo because I was the, I was the cool. caller out. <laughs> yeah. We used to go to a warehouse and we used to purchase, it was prize bingo, so we used to purchase prizes like bread bins and stuff like that. Another generation cuddly toys. Yeah, and it was always, it was always very, very busy. It was a really, really good night out. Um, and I can't even remember why it folded, to be honest. But again, it would have been probably 90, 93, 94 that it actually folded. Mm. So yeah. It, so how, so you, how long were you, did you serve on the council? Um, I was elected. What year would I have been elected? Strike ended in '85. Um, probably about, probably about '87. Right. Um, and I resigned in '93. Good Lord, you had six oh. good years. Mm. And what, I mean, what do you do on, what, what do you, Nothing. what do you do? <laughs> <Nothing>. <laughs> it was a very, I have to say, my time in Askin Town Council was a very non-event. Right. And the year that I spent as mayor was, um, I actually gave out trophies at a uh, right. swimming gala at Askin Baths. Ceremonial. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, but other than that, it was um, quite boring actually. We didn't, we didn't do anything. Hmm. We really didn't. It's twenty past ten. Oh, what does that mean? Is that a point that's not flowing? Oh, is it that? only twenty past ten? It seemed to be any miles longer than that. Actually, look like me. Yeah. I have no idea. When your hair goes on, I'll show you. Okay. You'll be shocked otherwise. I'll do some hair now. It's under my armpit, your hair. Oh, is it? Yeah. Warm. I think we're getting somewhere. At least it looks quite smooth. Yeah. No, don't show me. I don't keep it. Just gotta get those eyes. Get those. Just get those bags over your eyes, Jim.
one of the funny things during the strike actually, um, my husband had a, a white consul, I think it was, and he'd not passed his test. So every time he went out picketing, he was in danger of being, those years are long, he was in danger of um, getting caught without a license. Yeah. Because there were always, like, you know, there were roadblocks and they'd stop them and they'd have to try and walk the way, like they weren't pickets, this kind of thing. Oh, OK. Um, and I can remember this particular day, he was actually pulled up. And if you got pulled up by the police, you had to um, produce your licence at, uh, at the police station, at the local police station. Um, so he got pulled up and they gave him a producer and he said, Oh my God, not again. And the chap said to him, have you, have you done this before? And he said, I must have produced my licence four times, he said. And he went, oh, go on then. Really? I'll, I'll let you off. <laughs> so, Good God. Yeah, which was very, very Quick lucky. thinking. Yeah. He actually didn't pass his test until 1992. And he died in '93. Gosh. Mm. And he, he not, not he had failed. He took his test a couple of times and failed. But um, yeah. So that was uh, that was a, a lucky escape for him. Talk about that. That's yeah. quick thinking beyond. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So the police presence was pretty heavy, I imagine. Oh, it was. It was, I mean, when we used to go picketing, the, the women, we, we used to have our Col Not Doll t-shirts on. And every time that we um, saw that we were coming to a rope block, we'd take them off and put them on, turn them inside out and wear them back to front and tell them we were, we really? were off, yeah. Kind of mean, so they really were trying, obviously, obviously it was seen as completely illegal and you were trying to be you oh, yeah. definitely a, uh, an anti-establishment scenario yeah. where police were actively trying to stop you doing what you're doing. Oh, yeah. Which was, I su you know, I suppose legally it's a lawful right to strike, wasn't it? Mm. Yeah, they were always trying to turn you back. Um, well, they, you know, they didn't want you there. They were, yeah. they were um, like armoured buses going into some pits with people that were strike breakers. Um, yeah. it, um, and some people have spoken about the fact that you know, the army were used. Yeah, not not uh, not anywhere that I ever went. But yeah, it was anything. They, they would, um, you know, the Met Police. They brought the Met Police up, mm. didn't they? To uh, and, and and to be honest, I, I never had any police bother personally. I can remember once we were um, picketing at Calverton and uh, there were probably about 60 women from, not all from Askin, probably only a couple of cars full from Askin, but I can remember um, just being surrounded by police that kind of herded us into a, a tight knit and we were surrounded by police mm. and um, there was one probably a, a sergeant or a, I don't know. But he said, they want to act like men, treat, treat them like men. He said, nick them and kick them. Yeah. That, that is gospel truth. And I can remember two policemen coming into the middle of the crowd of us and they got hold of this woman, I didn't know her and I still don't know who she was, but they dragged her out and she was on her knees. Oh. And it actually, um, frayed the denim where they dragged her frayed the denim on a on a knees and made her knees bloody and i don't know if it was some <coughs> excuse me i don't know if it was somebody that had that seen on another picket line that they targeted or if they'd heard her say something or but the way they treated her was just Absolutely appalling. Honestly, it was. And does the crowd respond to that? Did the group respond to that sort of behaviour? Only with only well with jeering, but like I say, we were hemmed in. We were just completely hemmed in by um, police 
all round. That's quite a scary scenario. It was, it was. And they did manage, we, actually they did break the ring, when, because cars, people were working at Calverton, and um, so cars were coming in and they did break the ring. Um, that was the night Diane got arrested. Uh, but there were, that, I think that was the only time I ever really saw any, any real violence on a, towards women on a picket line. Mm. I mean, the men had some really nasty experiences, not, not particularly men from Askham, but I mean, you know, throughout the country. Yeah. People were killed, people were injured, people were beaten. Yeah. Just trying to get a job thing. Yeah. Yeah, and it was revenge. Yeah. Revenge for what was it? Well, it was revenge for um, bringing down the Heath government, wasn't it? The Seventy-four strike. Mm. She um, she was determined. There must be years and years and years and years of coal in this country. They don't care. The winter of discontent. Yeah. They don't care. Three day week electrical. And we keep voting them back in and voting yeah. them back in. That's why voting should be compulsory. Mm. Should definitely be should be fined if you don't vote. So we've got children? I've got four daughters. Four daughters? Yeah. And are they, were they born before or after the...? Ah, uh, they were all born before the strike. My, my youngest was uh, nearly 13 when the strike started. And I had my first grandchild during the strike. In the June as the strike started in the March, the first grandchild was born. And I can remember Coming back from picketing, and my husband being stood outside the welfare saying, Joanne's gone into labour. And getting straight in his car and sitting in Doncaster Royal Car Park, <laughs> waiting for somebody to come out and tell me that my daughter had given birth. Wow. <laughs> so is she what you would call a strike baby? He is a he was a strike baby, yes. So then she went on to have three more sons and a daughter. Jesus. How many grandchildren have you got all together? I've got um, five, six, seven. I've got eight grandchildren. I've got I've got nine grandchildren if you because I've got um, my daughter. One of my daughters adopted a little boy. Mm -hmm. So I've got nine grandchildren. I've got uh, five great-grandchildren, and another one due any day now. Really? Mm. I've got a and daughter. Where are they based? Where's Sorry? The, where's the new one coming from? Where do they live in Doncaster? Yeah, sure, she lives in Pontefract now, but um, yeah, she's always lived in Doncaster. I actually live with my one of my daughters. All right. Because I'm only here for oh, six course. months of a year. So. Yeah, right. So you, you don't need a house. I don't. I've got the best of both worlds. So you're kind of like a second mother to the kids. <laughs> yeah. Well, they all left well, home now. They've all left. Yeah, they've all left home now. But two of her, three of her kids, live on the same street as her. Jeez. And the other one lives. Um, probably three streets away. And then one of her sons actually lives in London with my, one of my daughters actually. They work at the same place and they share a flat in London. God, where do they work? They work for a company called Mears. What does that do? It does, um, it does contract work for councils, you know, council repairs. Oh. So my daughter's a, a contracts manager 
um, in uh, Wandsworth in London. She lives in Bromley. And my grandson actually works for her in, in her office. <laughs> yeah. So how, 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 I mean, you must be spending a lot of your time visiting. Um, well, my daughter, in, is, um, I, I, I go to my daughter in Australia every year. Um, my daughter that lives in London, either she comes up here or I spend weekends down there. Mm. So, yeah, I suppose, I suppose we do. I spend a lot of time with Diane, my niece. Um, but yeah, I'm keep myself busy. Yeah. So what's your main kind of activity now then? And now you're no longer the mayor and... <laughs> I haven't been for a lot of years. Yeah. Um, I suppose... Are you community just, active? No. No, I'm not. So after all that been, kind of history? Yeah. No, I'm not a, at all anymore. Is that through the fact that there's less to be in part of? Yeah, and I think things just change, don't they? You know, um, like I say, my, like my daughter emigrated in 2007. Um, so I've spent a lot of time over there. Um, uh, then four years ago, I went to live with um, another daughter, my other daughter. Um, she's the one with the five kids. She's got Jesus. she's got five grandkids. So there's always something to do or somewhere to go. Or I walk a lot. All right. I like to walk every day. I try and um, is that try in the, uh, out in the countryside or uh, no? It's not. It's not hiking. No, no. I try to walk about. I try to walk at least three miles a day just simply to try and stay healthy, mm. but um, it's, it's the feeling that you've got to feel safe these days. Right. Asking is not, um, it's not, not a nice place to live. You just have to be very careful. There's some really not very nice people mm. live in Asken at the moment and I mean, like, um, there was a chap drawing money out of a cash machine in a shop, um, and somebody stole it off him as he was yeah. getting it out, actually, in the shop. They were stood outside, because it's quite near the door. Um, people are getting broke into week after week really? after week. Everybody, you know, you read these comments on... Um, I am on Facebook, although I don't put anything on Facebook. I just like to see the gossip and stuff. You know, I like to see what's going on. Um, and you see all these posts about, you know, people know who's doing it. You know, it's this, it's him again, it's him and her again, whatever. Um, but nothing, nothing's changing. Nothing seems to get done. Like, and do you know what the cause of it is? Well, there's a lot of drugs. Right. There's a lot of um, unemployment, but it's, it is it is the drugs. It's um, it's like I mean there was a time when if I went if I walked down to the shop, I went down you know if I went down the village if I went for a walk around our lake, I would see somebody I knew. It could take you you know you could be five minutes away from the shop. It might take you three quarters of an hour. Yes. Because you'd see somebody you knew, you'd yeah. stand chatting, you'd see somebody else you knew. I can walk around our village. I do walk around our village and not see anybody I know. Mm. Just don't see people that you know, you know, you, even the younger ones, the, the younger mums and dads, you don't know whose kids they are. At one time, you know, if, if you saw a young person in Ask, you'd know who the mum was or who the dad was. Yeah. Um, you don't anymore. You don't, you don't know each other. Mm. It's, if I, I'm like, like I, I brought my bag out with me today. If I were walking around Asken, I would only carry things in my pocket. I would not give anybody any cause to yeah. think that, 
You had something to take. Yeah, that I had something to take. So if I needed to take any money, and I usually take a bit of money in case I do see anybody I know, so we could, you know, because we have quite a few um, cafes in Askham. Yeah. Well, if I see anybody I know, at least we can go for a coffee. I never do, but I always like to carry a bit, but just I just in case. carry it in my pocket. So that's cough. Yeah, there's no sense of... Um, if I'm saying there's no sense of community in Askham. There is in so much as if somebody's in need, there are always people that will come forward and, and try and sort that need. Like, at the moment, um, we've had two fundraisers going on. There's a little boy called Keegan, who was, I think he's about 13, and um, he needed a, a contraption to enable himself to, to feed himself. Oh, right. um, and then we've got a little boy called Lucas, who's about probably about 14 months old, who needs a, a monitor uh, because his mum doesn't can't get a good night's sleep because she's got to be watchful of him all the time. So there's been a really, really good drive um, to raise funds for both these kids. Sort of Facebook drive? Um, yeah, and, uh, uh, not just on Facebook. There's, you know, there's been raffles. There's been, um, like, the other Sunday I went to a, an afternoon tea right. that our local cafe had put on to raise funds um, for Lucas. This is the little boy that needs the, um, the alarm. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, people... People do still come together if if there's a need. So it, it's wrong to say there's no longer any sense of community. No. Um, I just think people, they, it's it's not a friendly bumping into people you know every day. It's a case of people coming together when there's a need. And do you think, obviously, the mines closing down and stuff. With the first, yeah, the first point of yeah, that kind of I do. It was it, it's just been totally. I mean, I suppose for my generation, a lot of us have died. Mm. You know, so you're not going to bump into those people anymore when you go shopping or or um, anything. It, it's you don't always realise that your generation is dying off. And that you know, there's a, there's a new generation following, but there's lots of um, there's lots of new people in the village. At one time, a place like Askin, it would be like my mum and dad, and then me and my brothers and sisters and our families, and it, it's. And then, obviously, you know, their families, and it was just generation after generation, but it's not like that now. It's more uh, new people. I mean, we've had hundreds of houses built oh, right. in Askin, and every time one's finished, it sells. Yeah. But it's not... I don't know anybody that's bought one, put it oh. that way. So, so what type of people are moving in? Uh, I don't know, because I don't meet them. No. Professionals, so, or you don't know whether they're no, I don't. Just working in Doncaster, or yeah. just commuting, or yeah, we see. Askin's quite a clean place now, environmentally. I mean, mm. it's um, it's quite a clean place, and it's it's got easy links to Doncaster, Selby, York, M62, M1. Yeah. So, I'm sure it is attracting lots. Of, well, it's got to be attracting lots of people from, you know, from elsewhere. Um, But you don't get to know them. No. You're kind of busy keeping your family all the time. It's quite sad, really. I mean, I don't know if if you've got those same vibes off other people. That oh yes, you've spoken it's a definitely to. definitely a theme. Is it? So you don't. It seems there's a mu since the mines have closed. <clears throat> this this kind of sense of well. I always say that when I go back down south, I'm always amazed at the kind of sense of community that is here. Mm. I'm a, you know, there's a oh, yeah. Well, that is there's different, a bond, isn't it? 
there's a bond which everyone's had, mm. and I'm meeting mining communities. Yeah. Um, I'm, you know, I don't have where I come from, and I go home thinking, God, you know, there's this incredible community, but yeah. I'm also painfully aware of the people that it's nostalgic. We're talking quite a lot yeah. nostalgically about a time when everyone looked after everyone else's back. Yeah. They were all working together, and the community under the mine was reflected in the community yeah. on top of it. And yeah. And we had, I mean, I mean, it wasn't only the mine, we had a coal light plant. 20 minutes. 20 minutes, okay. We had a wood yard. Yeah. Um, they've gone. There's no industry yeah. in Askin at all now. I'll tell you, there's a place that makes wooden um, reels. But other than that, we've got nothing. We've got a lovely lake. Um, and like I say, it's, it's clean now where it what you know, the air's clean mm. in Askin now. Got all these masses and masses of houses just seems to be wherever there's a wherever there's a spare piece of land, there's a housing estate. Yeah. You know, it's um for the strangers. And I know that it's Obviously, it's going to be good for the village, and it's going to be good for the um, for the businesses. But um, people don't know each other. I don't know. Maybe it's when these estates get established, properly established, then that these new communities that they're building yeah. might come together. They might be community again, rather than isolation. I don't know. Well, I mean, you know, down where I come from, I mean, there's, there's housing estates developing. I mean, live in small towns, probably similar to Askin. And it strikes me that all the business is travelling out to the bigger towns. They're all, they're all commuting out of the yeah. this village, as it were, yeah. every morning and coming home at night and actually spend no yeah. time at all yeah. in the, the towns are still dying. Still dying. Yeah, because the they, they come in, they drive into the garages with the yeah, electronic yeah. doors, don't they? They, yeah, put, yeah. they have a, get a door from the garage into the house. You don't have to see anybody. Yeah. You really don't have to see anybody. That's one of the things that struck me during the strike, because I, I didn't know many Southerners before the strike. Um, and I think that, that was one of the things that took me by surprise, how supportive they were, mm. how, how much they actually wanted to help us, you know, mm. how much they wanted us to win this fight and how they just do whatever they could to enable us to do it. And then I remember writing to um, one of the girls that I knew down there um, and I sent the letter to the wrong flat number. She never got it. Really? Yeah, yeah. Like, she lived in two and I might have sent it to one, um, but the next time I saw her, she said, they never brought it to me. Mm. So that's, you know, so I suppose people that live in the, um, in, uh, not necessarily just London, but they don't always, they don't have that sense of community, no. do they? No. They are isolated from their neighbours. I don't know if it's the different, all the different nationalities or, well, I just think you know, you've got a common industry, mm. you're going, it's going to develop a common bonds, isn't it? Yeah. And everyone's got different jobs in different places, and yeah, you know, working damn hard and getting home at night knackered. The community's often at work. They, I mean, it was more like you know, community seems to me now to be like on online. Yeah, a lot of that has online done online yeah, community. yeah, that has done a lot of not good. And also, people have their lives at work. Yeah, they come home at night, and it's like well. I know, and that when you, true. and when you go on social media, everybody seems to have these perfect lives, don't they? Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, they don't Pictures talk. Of us. Yeah, they don't talk about the hardships, or it's just the good things in the life, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it was never meant to be for that either, was it? It was meant for people to um, just catch up, really, with people that had not seen for years or yeah. it just I, it's just spiraled out of control and like i say i don't very very rarely post um anything i'm 
might sometimes say Jean Crane checked into Dubai Airport. <laughs> Show say. what a wonderful life you're leading. Yeah. No pictures of you in Australia. <coughs> no. Sunbathing. No, I don't. Um, I don't do that. But funnily enough, when I do meet people that I do know, and there are still some, the odd one that I went to school with, then they'll say to me, "When are you off again?" Really? Oh yeah. How long are you home for? I thought some. I thought you'd moved to Australia. No, I don't live in Australia. I just visit. Oh, I know that does actually look like me. Does it? It's awful. Don't say yeah. that. Beautiful. No, it's not. <laughs> now, do you want me to go for glasses? I'm up, I don't care. I didn't, I didn't wear glasses during the strike. Could be bizarre, actually. I don't, know, I don't know, it's just very difficult to... They just kind of look false and they're not really part of the real you, in a sense. And I kind of date the sculpture, I think. I kind of want to see a style of glasses yeah. from the 1970 or 80s or whatever. You're going to get one of these. You get one as a present. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a pity I can't have it for tonight. I could get kids away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't glare I've at me. You scare me. I have got <laughs> eyes, honestly. with that thin actually. Might be a bit broader, you might be right. Hmm? Might be a bit broader. People often expect it to be an exact copy, but it is an impression. Mm. It's impossible at this speed. Well, that's very good actually. To um I know that looks like me. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not impressed, but it, does look, <laughs> but it does look like me. You have got quite a Durham face. A what? Durham. Durham? Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. I like, Actually, last time I went to Oz, I came back two stone lighter. So Did you? Yeah, that's why my face looks Two so. stone? Mm. I did. How did that happen? Just walking. My mm. daughter not feeding me. They're very, Jeez. they're very um, fitness conscious. My daughter and my daughter has got MS. Oh right. Um, Jesus. She's That's uh, heavy. Yeah, but she's very active. She's very. Fights. I mean, the weather out there is good for her oh, right. because she's got MS, and she didn't never, she don't let it get her down. No. She's very, you know, she goes to the gym. She walks a lot. She only eats healthy. So if there's anything unhealthy I want to eat, I have to go out and buy it. So that takes that down. So, yeah. Jesus, how long has she been diagnosed? Um, she emigrated in 2007. So she was probably diagnosed in 2003. Really? Mm. And she used to take, um, she used to have injections delivered to the house, the uh, beta ferron. Mm -hmm. But then when they decided to emigrate, um, she knew it, she was, it was iffy, the fact that she had MS. Oh, right. You know, that she'd be accepted. Oh, God. And it's my chin really like that. I'm just going to work it out. That's what I used to oh. pay the least attention on that. Okay. And um, that might be so real. she came off it. She came off the beta fear on. Um, and when she told me she was emigrating, I, obviously I didn't want her to go, but um, I thought, oh, she's got MS, they won't let her in. Huh. And they did. Really? So did she tell them? Oh yeah, you have to have loads of medicals and it's really hard to get um, immigration permission for us. So yeah, she had to have all the, um, all the medicals and everything. I mean, she's on medication again now that she's 
over there. I mean, she's been there 10 years now. But um, when you emigrate, you can't claim any state benefits or anything for two years after you get there. Mm. You have to have a sponsor that says, if you need anything, they'll sort it because the government won't, which is another good thing. Um, so you can't claim anything. Uh, but she's now back on, on medication. But it's private health care out there anyway. Yeah. So we get paid for it. Painful bit. You're doing them bloody wrinkles, oh, aren't you? There's only one that needs to be... <laughs> there's one that describes the whole cheek. All right. Sorry. <laughs> That's because I've lost two stone, you see. They, they, they would have been smoothed out if I hadn't lost that weight. Even my daughter said to me, I hope we can lose some of them wrinkles. <laughs> there are not many in there. No, they're very rough finish, aren't they? Yes. Yeah. Impressions. Yeah. Well, I've got to say, if I walked up to that one, I'd think, oh, that looks like me. <laughs> well, I hope I've been interesting enough for you. You are? I hope I've been interesting oh, yeah. enough for you. Brilliant. Fascinating. So how long, have they decided how long the actual audio will be once the... Um, yeah, about, I think it'll probably come down, well... Come down about half an hour, 20 minutes. All right. Does Depends on whether how much funding we get to do the editing, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. You have to th they have to take into consideration how long they think somebody will stand there and listen as well. Well, you've got to remember, you can download it and play it at home type thing. Oh, yeah. So you can take it all home. I mean, I think yeah. it'll be... No, no one's ever going to listen to that, everyone. But there'll be researchers, you know, you're talking... Mm. We're talking along, you know. I'm, I'm thinking generationally. <laughs> Yeah. And we, but this is a legacy we're talking about. Yeah. So, you know, in, you're not going to get people, I mean, you might get people now, mm. but, you know, in 50 years' time, yeah. you know, these are going to be, it's going to be fascinating, isn't it? Yeah, I've got a DVD somewhere. Of, during the strike, I was interviewed for a television programme. I think it was something a bit like Channel, or did we have a channel? I don't even know if there were a Channel 5, probably Channel 4 or BBC 2. And I had it on video, and I keep meaning to search it out and have it put on a, a DVD. Because we had a book written about, as you know, yeah. Aston Women Support Group. It was called All the Fun of the Fight. Thank it you. was written by Jane, um, Jane Thornton, who married John Godber. Oh. Do you know him? Really? Have you heard of him? He's a playwright. Yeah, that's right. Good, good, yeah. A northern playwright. He's yeah. really good. Um, yeah, she wrote a book. It's called All the Fun of the Fight. Wow. And have you got it? Uh, I think I've given all my copies away. My, I know my daughter's got one somewhere, but you can still get it from Doncaster Library if you'd like to read it. Oh, I would. It was, um, it's amazing how many books I've got. Jo Joan Hart's Pit Nurse all right. book. She's a character. Yeah. Nearly as big a character as you. <laughs> The women are characters around here. I bet the fellas have had some really interesting yeah. stuff though, haven't they? For from strike, the ones that. Yeah. Have you, 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 you have done a deputy, haven't you? You've done a. Have I done a deputy? Well, when I was, when Diane and I went for our photos, the first time we went to, we went to um, Arndale Centre, still call it Arndale Centre. Um, there was a chap there filling his form in about oh. who he was. And Joe was there, and I said, I was sec shall I put secretary, ask a women's support group? And he said, oh, I think I'd better get this form done and be off. And I said, why? And he said, oh, we're a deputy. Oh, really? Well, it was quite a big bone of contention, wasn't it? That, In fact, our support group actually split into two support groups because of the deputies. So what did the deputies, so they were the bosses in a sense of the shifts? Well, yeah, they, yeah, and they didn't strike. So they had to stay in? They didn't work, but they didn't strike. And they what was their conference, why was they compromised like that? Well, they wouldn't cross a picket line, um, but
but they still got paid because they sat in um, in the uh, first aid rule. Oh yes, I heard this. We have had this story. You have right. you? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it, we put collection boxes out in shops and and stuff around the village uh, when during the strike, and a couple of the ladies decided to put one in the uh, first aid room oh. and uh, came in with this money um, and we were all commenting on about oh that's you know how much money there was in this particular tin and then when they said they'd got it from the deputies the um, the union didn't want us to take it and we didn't want it either really mm. Um, simply because they weren't by not crossing the picket line, they weren't supporting the strike. Because even if they'd have crossed it, there were nobody for them to um, to manage. To manage, um, and so there was arguments, um, and then the ladies that had collected this money took it um, and set up their own um, support group in Council and Norton. Because it was quite a lot of money then. Um, I, d I can't remember how much they actually collected at that particular time, but then obviously they went on to do their own fundraising and. Um, yeah. So yeah, so it did it's cause. Those kind of principles so that amaze me at this time. Yeah. You know, and this time we need it. Still, there's stuff coming through. It's badly, badly needed, and there'll be a principled yeah. kind of. It's really strange actually because my son-in-law that lives in Oz, he was a striking miner, and his dad were a deputy. Really. Is that your time up? Is that saying, God that's it, your two hours are up? Put a, sh put a shilling in the meter. been brilliant. I wish I could say the same for you. <laughs> <laughs> That's the usual response. <laughs> I can even tell it's me from the side. You're not happy are you? No. <laughs> but I've got to say I've never been photogenic ever. Even when I was younger. I've never ever been one of those people that you know, you take a photo of her and she looks... Stunning. Yeah. Well, you do. You look yeah, really. I do. You, you're not going to get, you know, that standard Vogue model coming in here. It's no. not going to get, it's not going to be interesting to me. I nearly did me out this morning, and all before I came out, make it look like I had a bit more. But you didn't have time. No, I thought. Take me as I am. Yeah. Wrinkles and all. You are very good, I have to say. Thank you. Here we go, Smith. Time's up. Just as I'm getting. I bet you two have been having coffee with fag, haven't you? Or <laughs> we've been busy. See, when they were smoked, that's yeah. a bit more difficult. We've been naming all the files, which is a horrible job. <laughs> Twenty-five seconds. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready. Hey, I'm ready for a fag. Let me tell you. That, am I really that mealy mouthed? Oh God, I don't know. Let's have a look. Jesus. I've been talking all the time, so the mouth is always a problem. Yeah, okay. 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 Right, a few minutes on it. Mealy mouthed. I do all look like one of them right stern old ladies. Like I'm, now my daughter probably my daughters probably think I am.
I'm just been telling him I'm really appalled at it. Actually, even I can tell it's me. Are we listening? Okay. <laughs> so when will I get my my one? It takes a time. I mean, when I next come up, I'll probably bring them. So it'll probably be yeah. next year now. Oh, no, just no November. November. Yeah, I'm no, well, I won't be here. Oh, you won't be here, won't you? No, you can give mine to Augie. Sorry, to Diane. Hog. Okay. Could drop off at the other end. Hmm? Drop off at the other end. Yeah, she'd like that actually. That yeah, would be good. Scary. Might probably scare her to death, but she would love to see you. Yeah. She's quite nervous now, you know, because clocks have gone back. She's got a nervous head on again now because she hates the dark. I do see her most days. I take my iPad down. We play, we play gin rummy. Not together. We play different oh, okay. people. Yeah, but awesome. because I see her so often, you sometimes you run out of things to talk about. So she has her iPad, and I take my iPad, and we sit, we sit playing gin rummy. But at least it's company. Yeah, nice. So. They're doing really well at Bullcroft, though. You know. They've opened, the, you know, the cat you see on Facebook, the cafe's opened. Oh. They've got a, it's, what's it called? Mm. And then they've, they've done a, a charity shop. They've got Beverage, it's called, Bev Ridge. Uh. Mm. You know the people from the Ridge? Mm. They run it. Yeah. yeah. They had the slipper swap yesterday. What the hell's a slipper swap? I don't know, they get these boxes and boxes of slippers from somewhere. And because it's Bullcroft Memorial Hall and it's like, it's a charity. Um, they have to raise funds to keep this, um, this hall running. Um, and I don't know where they get them from. I don't know if you do, but they get boxes and boxes of new slippers. And then people can take their old slippers in and get a new pair. That's strange. You just, yeah, I think you have to fill a form in. Um, but I think it's, you know, like, it, especially at this time of year, you've got older people that, might have had a pair of slippers all summer and they're a bit raggedy um, and I think it's just so that they have safe slippers because they're all full slippers mm -hmm. with velcro mm. so I think it's just to make sure that no yeah mm. so they had that it was Monday actually not yesterday they did that so mm, we've got all sorts going on now she got a new boss because um, you would have known Annette I bet did yeah, you she's new now. yeah well now she's got somebody that's on secondment, uh, aren't they, Tracy from Norton? Tracy Mann? Yeah, I've heard, I have heard, I've heard about yeah. her. Yeah, oh, Diane loves her, she she's, and she's done so much while she's worked there. Um, and she's, uh, two years is up in March, and she's got to decide, does she want to stay, or is oh, she yeah, gonna go back, Tracy. to Tracy, does she want to stay, or is she gonna go back to her old job? Um, and she's just waiting to see what, she don't want to go back to her old job. She's just waiting to see what the trust offer her to stay. Good. Yeah, but she's done so much in the like the two years that she's been there. Mm. And Diane said she put so much effort in. She's really good. Got quite a dinky little nose, though, aren't I? No. I mean, like, my nose is in proportion to my face, isn't it? We're always critical of ourselves, aren't we? I mean, you can't do anything about it, can you? Like, I've always had this thing that I won't let my family call anybody ugly. I think it's a horrible word. You know, when they say, now she is ugly. <laughs> uh, I, I think it's awful. And I always say to them, nobody can help how they look. You can't. All right, you can pay a lot of money not to look how you, how you look, but you can't help it, can you, how you look? And, and I always say that there aren't any ugly people. You get beautiful people, you get bonny people. You get people that are just ordinary, that don't make them ugly. I mean, it really does wind me up when I hear them say, like, especially, that is one ugly baby, I think. Oh, how, can you, <laughs> how can you say that? Just... <coughs> That is one ugly ear. There's <laughs> <laughs> an earring. Shuffy yeah, now. They're earrings. Are they? <laughs>
Yeah, they'll say, oh, yeah, that's definitely Jean. Look at them lugs. <laughs> I've given you a little smile. Oh, good. Well, Thank I think you. I have. Yeah. My, I say, my son-in-law said my me, me portrait was too stern. You don't look like that. I said, well, obviously I do. I said, anyway, they wanted the wrinkles, because I, I said to him, can you get far enough away not they to get me wrinkles? Any of the other building, but and he said, no, that's what we want. Yeah. The wrinkles. I suppose a bit of stuff, I'm not going to get a break, am I? No. That's five minutes in to the break. Oh. I could go on. What What time is... Next one's in an hour. Oh, I could easily get two cups of coffee, four fags and a sandwich in an hour. <laughs> Lawrence is an artist. You have to think about the lunch first. <laughs> Should have brought a pack up. Of what? They can't actually. Five to six, then. <laughs> Can, yeah. Council put some quite nice buffies on them. Should have just thought they do. Got something prepared for you. Sorry. <laughs> Is it empty? No, it's uh, after. Oh, I'll take that again. Do you have to go out here? See, he says, yeah, the mirrors are definitely too big. Did you Are you just here for today? Yeah. We had a meeting with site meeting and stuff, so I thought I'd get a couple of heads in while I was up. All oh, right. And you're actually going to get three in. Yeah. Oh, excuse me. I'm going to go and have lunch with my friend now. It's the last day working on the market today for, and she's been there about 23 years. Good the market here is amazing, isn't it? Mm. Well, it will be that. again, hopefully, because that's not like it used to be. But with all this money they're spending, I think it will will see an upturn. But she's um, she sold second-hand baby clothes oh. for the last, like I say, for the last 23 years, and it's her last day today. She's actually retiring. Getting you a bit wider in the face. Oh, thank you. I don't think my face will like skinny, really. Yeah. So, Joe, you know when you send me this thing that I can log on to hear this? Yeah. Will I be able to hear everybody? Will, will I be able to hear everybody else as well that you've already yeah, done? Yeah. Okay. Well, that should keep me. Thirty-six hours worth. Entered yeah, really. Well, I'll get you to Australia. Yeah. Oh God. Me and Lawrence have watched them all twice. <laughs> Much to Vicky's disgust. <laughs> I'm feeling sorry for you now, Lawrence. What sandwich? Yeah. yeah. What sandwich do you want, Lawrence? Oh, crikey. Um, like cheese and tuna. Sort of a tuna thing. Be nice, it's not tuna mayonnaise. <coughs> I don't know why people that tuna? make sandwiches tuna. assume everybody likes sloppy um, no, fillings. Are you done now? You, well, I could go on, but I should stop. Thank you. Stop. Why 
have I got one eye? <laughs> one eye what? My eyes are, are my eyes really odd? To turn it around. Is that because you've got an eyeball in that and you haven't got one in that? Mm -hmm. or Don't do it now. No, no. I'm just checking out. I'm just checking out. Sometimes, you know, it's good to know. It's just a lot like one eye's open and one eye's no. I thought it was because you had an eyeball in one and not in other. I can't believe now. You're the first one that bossed me about. <laughs> I know, go and get your sandwich now. I'm, honestly. I'm happy it's with good, it. No, it's ha good. I'm happy with it. <laughs> You're not supposed to be. No, but you are. I found you on Facebook anyway, so. You found me on Facebook, yeah. or did you? Did you find Diane? I'm not really friends with Diane. Are you? Oh, you mean Diane? No, I meant our oh, Diane. Oh, yeah. When you sent her that photo, you said it was Diane, didn't you? You yeah, thought I was Diane. Yeah, I forgot it. Because, well, I was just thinking of Diane when yeah, I said it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Notice any difference? <laughs> was that just a waste of time? <laughs> oh, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> you got any white spirit in the building? Yeah. Can I put my glasses on? Yeah, yeah. I can't smooth the wrinkles out of that white spirit. <laughs> um, yeah, you're done now. Yeah, I'll have a couple and I can smooth her out when she's, when she's gone. You know, if I had loads of money, that's the only thing I would change about me. Oh. My yeah. eyes. Really? Mm. I'd get rid of this. Really? And the, yeah. Because it's not an age thing, this. You know, most people get bags and get a bit slack when they get older. But this is a family failing. <laughs> These baggy eyes. And I've always, all, I mean, literally, my whole life, hated them. Really? Mm. And, it, yeah, like I say, it's the only thing that I would ever change. I don't care about the wrinkles or anything else. It's just the eyes. Sorry, I'm fidgeting now, aren't I? I'm just taking, I always take advantage of the, this time. It's often a bait where you actually have to sort out the real problems and make the difference until they really drag you away. Do you want me to take my glasses back up? Yeah, you've magnified all the wrinkles, it's great. Oh. <laughs> Thanks. It's just nice, if I had another hour, it's quite it, subtle. We usually do them up in two weeks. hours, so yeah. why is it...? Well, only because I have to. Oh, it would right. be great if I had you guys. Oh, you mean everybody? Yeah. It would be right. great if I had one, one a day. Mm. Well, it's a good eye, though, isn't it, that can do one every two hours? It's mad. Now. Yeah. It's funny that because they're so pale. My, my nail lady says to me, Do you let me dye your eyebrows? Thank you for your precious time. Now, I know it's you, at the end of the day, I go, oh, yeah, that got over. Yeah. Now you don't know. Oh, that's it. <laughs> you're hypercritical of yourself. I just don't know whether you've got it or not. Because if you just put something, you have. If you put something next to someone, it's yeah. never, it never looks like him. That's why these photographs are horrible. If you were, I'd know it with me. So I'll do a bit of smoothing out now. Okay. 
I need a toilet before I leave. It's just down the corridor on your way out. We're doing a quick. He's just gone off to do something. Bye bye, Jean. Oh, you're coming back? Oh, good. Good on you. You say that was a weird farewell. Thank you very much. You're coming back? No, I'm not now. Well, thank you. It's and it really does look 